Grace and peace to you and yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And welcome to Cedar Creek United Methodist Church, a church that is light, life, and love in our community, which is growing, serving, and loving all in the name of Jesus Christ. Friends, my name is Pastor Chris Beisline. I'm so glad you are joining us in praise and worship today. As always, we appreciate you liking this recording on YouTube and on Facebook, and then sharing it with your friends, as this is one way we are continuing to build our online community of faith. As we prepare for worship, light your candle in your sacred space to invite in the presence of God, just as we have lit our candles in this holy space. Make yourself comfortable as we settle in for worship today. Now breathe in and breathe out. And let's center ourselves for worship on this third Sunday after Pentecost. Today we're hearing a small portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus implores his disciples to step it up to raise the bar high when it comes to living their very lives as gospel, as the good news in their ministry together, by being salt and light in a city on the hill that cannot be hid. We hear, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. May it be so that we let our light shine so brightly, the love and the glory of God is made known to all whom we encounter. And friends, please pray with me. As we worship this morning, O oh God, we pray that your spirit will be our strength, your word will be our guide, your love our comfort, and your promises will be our hope through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let's worship the Lord. Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me? When I call Is it true that you are thinking of me How you love me It's amazing Sing it again Who am I that you are mindful of me That you hear me when I call Is it true that you are thinking of me How you love me It's amazing
God. I am a friend of God. You call me friend. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. Oh, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. You call me friend. This lamp is not very bright. I wonder what's wrong with it. It's plugged in. Hmm. Oh, I have to turn on the switch, right? That's better. <laughs> Jesus talked about light. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bushel. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When Jesus told us that we are the light of the world, he was giving us a picture of who we are supposed to be. We are to be Christians everywhere we go. We should act in such a way that others see Jesus in us, and because of what they see, they glorify God. Our problem is when the that when we see this picture that Jesus has given us in modern terms, we think about lights today. Lights today come with a switch. We can easily turn them off and back on. And that's our view of Christianity today. We turn it off and on as we please. If we want to act like the cool kids around us for a while, then we turn our light off and we act like the world. Then when we feel like doing something for Jesus, we turn it back on again. If we, wanna, if we don't want to talk to that person sitting all alone on the playground, we just turn off our light. And then when we decide to help someone pick up their papers that they just dropped, we turn it back on again. When we don't stick up for someone that others was making fun of, we turn off our light. When we are back at church, we turn the light back on. Funny thing is, that doesn't work. When we act like the world, people who don't know Jesus see us, and then the world thinks we're just like them. Then when we decide to turn on our light, the world sees us as a fake or a phony. The truth is, switching the light off means knowingly and willingly choosing to sin. We are not doing what Jesus told us to do. Sin brings darkness instead of light. Remember, Jesus said we're not to pick up our lamp or hide it under a basket. We're supposed to use it in the good way. The next time you think about hiding your Christian faith, remember that Jesus told us to let our light shine so that the world would see our good works and the world could glorify our Father in heaven. We don't let our light shine so others will say good things about us. We let our light shine so others will glorify God. I pray you will let your light shine today and throughout this week, everywhere you go. Let us pray. Lord, help us to let our light shine all the time, not just when it's convenient. Amen. I wanted so aimless life and wishing.
Please join me in the prayer for elimination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. Please stand as you are able for the reading and hearing of the gospel. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under the bushel basket. Rather, they put it on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hi, church. Remember the earliest days of COVID-19? Do you remember how weird and frightening those days were? Those days before a vaccine was available, the days that some of us scrambled to get the vaccine when we could, particularly those of us in the at-risk category of not faring too well with COVID-19. The way that life came to a screeching halt for most of us. The way the life of the church came to a screeching halt. It was right before Easter in 2020. We thought we'd be shut down for a week, maybe two. Surely if everyone just stayed put for two weeks, this whole virus thing would miraculously disappear, right? Unfortunately, that didn't happen, and we had to learn to navigate life differently, even life in the church differently. On the Sunday before we shut down, we had the awkward conversations about washing hands, of no longer having things available for people to touch, like worship bulletins and hymnals, books for our children, we wiped down all door handles and surfaces that we touch. We stopped physically passing the offering plate. We encouraged the wearing of masks. People worked from home as best they could, claiming workspaces and closets and portable sheds. Parents had to figure out how their kids could keep up with their schoolwork remotely via Zoom and other formats. A bit more challenging for those of us in the more rural parts of Bastrop County where internet connections, if you even had them, we're sketchy at best. In that alone, we learned about the inequity of access to the greater world via the internet. Many kids fell behind in what they needed to be learning in school, but oh, what a different learning experience they had. Do you remember how strange it was to venture out for groceries or doctor's appointments? The streets and the highways were empty. Businesses were closed. Restaurants had to pivot hard to offer takeout food as the new normal. Service workers became essential workers, and they definitely were, and still are. We should continue to recognize them as such. As the church, we moved toward online worship, something that we had actually talked about a week or two before we shut down, but which took on a different urgency. And like many other churches, we wrestled with the need to still be in communion with one another and to offer Holy Communion in a way that did not really meet the standard of gathering as a church community around the table to receive the body and the blood of Christ. Yes, we offered drive through communion, and those of us who participated in it felt the presence of the Lord in their own cars, and they were just so happy to see those of us who were serving, as well as those who were in the car ahead of them and those who were behind them. And some parked their cars in the parking lot to listen to our musicians who offered music through that new worship experience via our own FM transmission station. We offered a church family check-in via Zoom during the day and at night as a way to stay connected with one another. We offered Sunday school and Bible study in the same way. Our prayer team actively kept up with others in the church, sharing pastoral care needs with me and with the office. 
people everywhere found ways to be resilient, to do life differently and perhaps a little better. People learned to make bread, learned a foreign language, started painting and reading and binge watching TV shows. Families began to enjoy the time of sheltering in place with those they loved. Some of us got outside more than we used to. On the other hand, some of us experienced anxiety, depression, a loss of purpose. A sadness came over us for the things we were losing and had lost, knowing things that would never return to 100% to the way that the things used to be. We came to the realization that we had taken way too much for granted. We couldn't properly visit those who were sick and hospitalized due to the new visitation restrictions. We couldn't properly mourn and remember our loved ones who had died because there were limits on the numbers of participants who could physically attend a funeral. Who would have thought that if you were not in the top 10 friends and family list, that you'd be watching live stream version of this funeral? We tried to honor a six foot gathering distancing space that became the norm, some more respectful of others' personal space than others. And the list of how we adjusted goes on and on, but through the midst of the pandemic, many discovered how to be light and reflect light to others and those in these very different and weird times. Take, for example, a woman named Harriet Stubbs. Harriet was recently recognized on the Queen's birthday honor list for 2022 for performing 200 free concerts during the pandemic. Harriet Stubbs is a concert pianist from the UK. And according to ABC News, when coronavirus began to spread, Stubbs returned to London from New York City intending to stay a week, which turned into a year and a half. She was planning to record an album that mixed David Bowie songs with classical pieces. And while locked down in London, she practiced, and people would stop outside of her window to listen. And she was quoted as saying, I thought, what about if I just do this every day and left my window intentionally open because we've all lost routine. And what if it was just something that happened at the same time every day? So she began playing every day at five o'clock with her window open. She advertised the informal concerts locally as restrictions were lifted. The crowd grew larger and larger with her occasionally coming out to serve drinks and meet her fans. And Stubbs ended up performing 100 concerts in 100 days before taking a break. And then she returned and did another 100 concerts in 100 days. According to her website, she performed 250 shows. She remarked, the fact that people stood outside in the middle of December with masks on in the rain to listen to music through a sort of barred window on an amplifier that was distorted with busy intersection of traffic, if that doesn't tell us how much we need music as human beings, I don't know what does, she said. In Harriet Stubbs' way, she found a way to be light to a city that was hungering for something better, for something normal again, rather than being quarantined away from other people. She found a way to use her gifts and graces to offer this light as a means of hope in troubling times. I'm reminded that as we hear this passage, we're sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing what it is to be blessed. And not just blessed or happy or fortunate, as the word is sometimes rendered, but blessed by God. Blessed in poverty of spirit, blessed in mourning. We hear blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure of heart, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake. We are blessed as peacemakers. We're even blessed in persecution. Blessed not in just one of these attributes, but blessed in all of them. Blessed individually to some degree, yes, but to a greater degree, blessed as a new community of faith, blessed in relationship with God and with one another. Those who followed Jesus up the mountain and gathered around him as he sat down to teach were initially the first called disciples, but the crowd soon followed. Those who had heard or were touched by Jesus' healing and teaching ministries followed him up the mountain too all feeling called or feeling led to follow Jesus, the fulfillment of all the law and all the prophets, all blessed by God, blessed to be a covenant community molded and remolded, shaped and reshaped by God, blessed to witness the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in and through Jesus, blessed to be sought and light 
and a city on a hill that cannot be hid, so that others might come to know the love of God is revealed in Jesus the Christ, blessed by God and now labeled too. I love the metaphor that Jesus uses to label these followers salt, light, a city on a hill that cannot be hid. The images evoke ancient memories and reminds the hearer of the physical properties of each item as they begin to make the connection of who and what God has created and are calling them to be. Take salt, for example. I like salt on my hamburger, on my french fries. It makes the flavor less bland. And sometimes I crave salt and go looking for chips or salted nuts. In some way, my body is saying it needs it. And from the most ancient of days, salt has been used as a preservative too, an essential ingredient for curing meats, especially in the days before refrigeration. So in just these two examples alone, Jesus says to the crowd and he says to us today, you are flavoring and you're preservative. You are salt. You are. The people Jesus was addressing understood salt to have far more reaching connotations than just being used for flavor or as pre a preserving agent, however. Salt was used in sacrifice. Salt signified loyalty and covenant fidelity. Salt was used in purification rites. Here's my favorite. Eating together was called sharing salt and expressed a binding relationship. Being salt implied all of these things with the greater overarching message that this is who they are in relationship with one another. This was who they are in the community of faith, in its mission to the world. They are as we are, the salt that binds us together as the church, as we are also bound together to God, the source of our being. And Jesus doesn't stop with the community of faith being salt. He continues to paint a deeper and broader vision of who these followers and disciples are. They are light, light which illumines, light which allows us to see things as they are. The prophet Isaiah spoke of Israel being the light to the nations, even as they were returning to Jerusalem from their days in exile in Babylon. It was a vision not only that gave Israel hope for their restoration as a nation and as a people, but hope for the entire world who would flock to the city of Zion, the city on the hill. And just as Israel was called to be light, so too the new faith community was called light and its mission field for the entire world. They are light to all people, not just the ones who belong to the club or have the right connections or the right ID card, the right bloodline. This new community is inclusive of all God's children. The new community of light and salt is one in which righteousness prevails and justice prevails. The disciples and followers of Jesus are light and salt in a city on a hill that cannot be hid. Their saltiness and their shining is not for their own glory, but for God's. Who would have thought the majority of my legacy here would have been spent working with some outstanding lay leaders, staff, and volunteers trying to figure out how best to be the church and do church in the midst of a global pandemic? I will tell you this. I think we did it well. We prayed to God for guidance. We did worship in ways that put to test the notions that we could not change or do this because, say it with me, We've never done things like this before. Church, you're awesome in the ways that you allowed yourself to be stretched in this challenging season. And so thank you for being light and salt and a city on the hill that cannot be hid. My friend Max would say, you do good church. You do good church. But you're not done. God is asking that you continue to step up, to continue to be salt and light in a city on the hill that cannot be hid. God desires that we remain in this partnership with God for the upbuilding of the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Know that you don't have to do it all or all by yourself. I guarantee that that will lead to burnout and we don't wish that on anybody. But you have the light of Christ within you to share this light with others, either as this big bright beacon shining brightly or as a mirror reflecting light into the world or perhaps serving as a cracked pot some of us are. You know the ones, the ones that have been broken and bruised and yet through the cracks and through the fissures. Light is still able to seep out for others to see the hope in Christ that lies within. Each one of you have gifts to share in this church and in this community. Don't hide your light under a bucket, as Jesus would say. Carry it forward. 
but only carry what you feel called and equipped to carry. You can do this. Know that you are not called and equipped to do everything in the life of the church. Keep focused on what and how God desires to be at work in you and in the upbuilding of the kingdom at Cedar Creek United Methodist Church and this community that surrounds us. I used to have a quote on my bulletin board that someone gave me a long time ago. At that time, it was the late 1990s that had been attributed to Nelson Mandela because he used it, I think, in his inaugural speech when he was elected the first black president post-apartheid in South Africa. Now, I've since learned that it actually was said by Marianne Williamson, and Mandela used it to inspire a nation to set aside old racial wounds and to live into its future. And the quote is this, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in all of us. And when we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Please hear this, church. Rinse and repeat. Our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us. It's in all of us. And when we let our light shine, we give permission to do the same. We give other people permission to do the same. And as we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Let your light shine. Be light. I could close here and be good, but I have a few other things to say to you since I'm retiring at the end of the month, and I can, so I will. So here are a few thoughts as we, as you, transition from my pastoral leadership to Pastor Russell Boland's leadership at Cedar Creek United Methodist Church. Number one, this transition is a bit different from the others I've experienced in my ministry because your new pastor and his wife and his family are expecting a new baby soon and very soon. And for this, we give thanks and praise to God. The baby's due in early July, which means we're honoring Pastor Russell's request for paternity leave during the month of July. Pastor Russell, however, plans to offer you a weekly recorded message in which you will begin to know him and his family before they arrive in August. So stay tuned. And rest assured, worship in the month of July will continue and will be amazing. Our guest preachers include our very own Reverend James McMillan, lay speakers Evan Files and Sue Craddeville, and possibly Fritzy Simons from our district office, as well as the new, I think I can publicly announce this, lay pastor to Haney Chapel, our very own Bob Wilson. Blessings abound in July as we hear the word of the Lord through these gifted pastors. And as I mentioned in Sunday school last week, you will want to be present to win. July is not the time to check out of church. As we state in our baptismal vows, our physical presence in worship is part of our spiritual obligation to Christ's church. Number two, money, 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 money. Nobody likes to talk about this in the church, including me. You don't want to hear it, but again, part of our baptismal covenant is to support the church with our gifts, and not just our spiritual gifts, but our financial gifts. I've mentioned that our giving has fallen short of our budget this year through the month of May, and I want to encourage you to work towards a tithe to the church. The word tithe scripturally meaning 10% of your income, or some would say your assets. Your first and your best fruits are given to the Lord before anything else, before your personal needs, your rent or your mortgage, and so forth. And I know it's hard. We're not all there, but there is a discipline we all need to be reminded of in our charitable giving. Begin the discipline of giving regularly. Whatever that amount of money might be, uh, set that for every week, set aside that gift to the, your church, or perhaps once a month, perhaps once a quarter, but make the discipline of regular giving part of your spiritual practice. You might only be at 2% or 3% level of giving. Great, we celebrate that. 
do this regularly and continue to strive for that 10% level. And if you are already faithfully tithing at 10% of your income or your assets, prayerfully consider bumping that amount up to an even greater level of giving, all to the glory of God. And remember that summer months are always challenging in the life of the church. Not just Cedar Creek, all churches. Some of us vacation in the summers and forget or don't think about that giving is important. And the reality is that the utility bills, the salaries, the maintenance, and so forth still need to be paid in order for ministry to continue at Cedar Creek. Please consider online giving or automatic bill pay or putting your check in the mail if you know you're going to be absent for an extended period of time, especially in these summer months. Number three, thank God we're through about talking about money. Number four, when I first came to Cedar Creek, we had high hopes for our future. We were ready and willing and able to meet and begin fleshing out our mission and vision statements. You can say them with me. Cedar Creek is a church that is light, life, and love in our community, and which is growing, serving, and loving all in the name of Jesus Christ. Once we agreed on our mission and vision statements, we were scheduled to begin working through our goals. COVID had other plans for us. We went into our season of hibernation or sheltering in place. All the while, God was at work in and through the Holy Spirit as we continued to discern what was expected of us as the church and how we might grow in our ministries and impact in our community through God's love. As things finally began to thaw in 2021 and continuing now into 2022, we began to reevaluate how God was desiring to use us in the upbuilding of the kingdom at Cedar Creek UMC. We set goals. We asked critical questions like, we have this goal so that Cedar Creek can fill in the blank. I will be reminding us of the goals we set in 2021 that we hope to accomplish within the next year. They have to do with building of relationships, of growing the church and more, of becoming financially stable, all to the glory of God. This is the hardest part of the conversation for me as the pastor of Cedar Creek United Methodist Church and for you, the church. We've traveled well through thick and thin together. As an elder in the United Methodist Church, I covenant with other elders in the order of elders to leave when I leave. When I leave at the end of the month, I'm no longer your pastor. I've been asked if I can be contacted after I retire. I can be. I can be emailed or called or texted or sent DMs on social media. But if you're calling or emailing or texting or DMing me with a personal spiritual matter for pastoral care, I will tell you I'm not your pastor anymore. And I will ask you if you have told your new pastor about your situation. If you say you have not, I will tell you to do so. And the things that you have said to me in confidence remains with me. So don't assume that Pastor Russell knows your stuff because he doesn't. If you want him to know what challenges you faced or how he can be in prayer for you, tell him. Another thing is this. It's not really appropriate to ask me to come back to do a wedding or a funeral or a baptism. Your new pastor is the presence of the United Methodist Church in this place. So allow him to be your pastor. And that being said, I will say to you that even though I am no longer your pastor, what we've shared together in this time and in this place is eternal and held within the life of God. There are bonds of friendship that, will, uh, that we have made over time that will never change. One of my greatest thanksgivings has been serving as your pastor during these past three years. And I continue to pray for you, and I covet your prayers for me. Number six. I have more to share with you, but you cannot bear to hear this all yet. Sound familiar? We just heard Jesus say these similar words to his disciples, disciples in John's gospel before his impending death a few weeks ago. It was part of Jesus' last conversation with his disciples or his farewell address as the scholars of the word like to call chapters 14 through 17 in John's gospel. Jesus spoke words to his disciples that included the commandment that they are to love one another. In this way, people would know that they are his disciples, if they love one another. So I want you to hear this. I love you. I'm so thankful for these last years that my appointed ministry have been spent at Cedar Creek UMC. You're an amazing church. 
You are light, life, and love in our community. You are. And I would like to think that with your help, we accomplished some pretty amazing things together in this season. And so thank you for helping me to grow in my ministry during this time and in this place. Thank you for staying strong in the faith in the midst of a global pandemic. Thank you for the ways which you supported the church in the pandemic with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness in the good news of God in and through Jesus the Christ. I pray that you continue to be light, life, and love of Christ in this place. And I cannot wait to hear what God will be doing in and through you next. Be light. Be light. Amen? Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We pray our time together has been a blessing to you. Please remember to like this recorded worship service on Facebook or YouTube and share this with your friends. This is how we are growing our online community of faith. Our next messy church is Sunday, July 10th. Come and see what worship looks like beyond the traditional setting in this family fun, intergenerational ministry in which we learn the stories of our faith the hands-on activities and leave the cooking to us as a free light meal will be provided to you and your family. A reminder that Cedar Creek offers a food pantry to the community on the second and fourth Wednesdays of each month from 9 till noon. Our next date is July 13th. If you or someone you know is in need of groceries, know that our cupboards are full. Please come. Thank you to all who uphold Cedar Creek with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. 
Together we are partnering with God to be light, life, and love in this community. If you would like to make a financial contribution to Cedar Creek, you may do so online via our website, cedarcreekumc.org. A reminder that there is a fee for online giving in which you will be responsible for. Or a check, you may write a check and put it in the mail to P.O. Box 33, Cedar Creek, Texas, 78612. Your tithes and offerings are greatly appreciated. Know we are praying for you, and I hope you are praying for Cedar Creek UMC as well. Receive this blessing as we say goodbye. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Friend of God, you call me friend.